Hello, Arabelle. Hi there. So I'm uh, Bill Black. Uh, this is Blogging Heads, and today we have Arabelle Raphael. Um, I wonder if you could introduce yourself briefly. Uh, yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm like, uh, what do I do? I do so many. <laughs> I'm a sex worker. Um, I'm a sex worker rights organizer, um, and I'm also an artist. I've been in the sex industry for about eight years, and I've done almost every job within that industry. Um, so I have a pretty wide like range of knowledge in in a lot of the diff- different jobs. Yeah, um, we're, so- we're going to talk talk about several things. Uh, yeah. The the changing porn uh industry the effect of fosta um we've had someone on uh blogging heads uh, a month or so ago and but that was before it really taken effect and so we're going to talk some about what that's actually meant on the ground but um uh so when where do you live Uh, i'm out of the bay area oh okay california how long you've lived there uh since i was five years old on and off since i was five yeah and how did you get into sex work? Um, you know, I w- was curious. Um, I was a nude model um, just because I thought that was fun. I was like 19 years old. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> I was like, this is going to be really fun and amazing. Um, so I did that. And uh, as I was doing that, I became more and more interested in shooting more explicit stuff so one day I went on kink.com and I filled out an application and um, that's kind of how I started Um, I did my first shoot and then I got connected to other people and you know I'm not your uh, stereo I mean there's no stereotypical porn performer but I'm definitely like uh, appearance wise more on the fringe end so I couldn't make a complete living off of just doing porn. So then I started uh, looking at other avenues of sex work. So I, I danced at a peep show at the Lusty Lady. I was a camp girl. I worked doing FBSM, which is a full body sensual massage, um, and worked in as an escort, pro dom. <laughs> tried on a lot of different hats, seeing what uh, fit best for me and my needs. So is it? Yeah. it seems to me that often uh, acting in porn is sort of a, a loss leader for people. And, and a, like, uh, what do you mean? Well, like a loss leader in economics is like uh, you offer something uh, either at price or even below price, but it's to get people into the store and then you sell them other things. Like often, you know, TVs will, will be so like that. And then they actually make their money from, you know, uh, stuff that goes along with it and, for certain people, you know, right? Um, the industry in general does just not make the same amount of money that it used to um, for varying, re- varying reasons. Uh, mostly nobody wants to pay for porn. <laughs> and I think they think of it in a different way than they do ethically when, like, pirating uh, other media, um, as well as, like, porn sites like, or not porn sites, but tube sites like Pornhub and you porn and all that stuff. Yeah, you know, I, over. for people who are, I'm 29. I think people yes. who are either like five years or more older than me or five years or more younger than me, they may not really realize how much the tube sites uh, change the industry. So I like when I was in high school, you know, if you were going to watch porn, then, you know, it was either, you know, buying or borrowing or, or you know a, like an actual dvd or it was going on you know one of these file sharing sites like uh um well lime wire and kazaa mm-hmm. st- all and, those yeah. and, and, and you know it, it would be you know a f- you know you 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 <laughs> guys would would amass these libraries of these kind of four minute clips oh yeah they still do it and, that's and, like i mean i've found series yeah. of all my content that people have amassed yeah but, <laughs> but it was like it, it. it definitely it it required a certain amount of time and effort and also just willingness to infect your computer with all manner of viruses 
Um, and then 2007, I, it, it was, so I, I graduated high school in 2007. I get to college and then, you know, and that is the year that Pornhub began and these other sites that are, for people who don't know, are essentially function like YouTube. So you're not having to download uh, stuff, you're just streaming it. And also, I suppose, yeah. just internet speeds got faster so that you, people were, were able to just stream. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I don't know, how is that? Because often that material on those tube sites, a lot of it is pirated. It's stuff that people have... Almost just... all of it is stolen, yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Um, now, there's there's different things. I would like to also say that... Um, most of those companies is owned by one company, oh, really? um, Manwin, that also owns browsers um, and a couple of other sites. It's kind of a porno monopoly. Okay. I mean, think about it. So, like, it's like these two big, big, like, mainstream porn sites, and then they own all these tube sites that are using content from all the other, all their competitors. Oh wow! Uh, to make money, it, it's it it is it's a, it's a porno monopoly kind of. It's uh, pretty interesting. Um, and so you could either fight it or sleep with the devil. Um, I slept with the devil um, after, you know, because I make my own content as well. I shoot for uh, companies and I make my own stuff. Um, and after, you know, sending like uh, cease and desists over and over and over and like the, those clips going back up, um, I decided to do, they have this uh, program for models where you put up your you know, a clip for free and you get paid like, I think per click. And I know that that is what companies now have started doing because Mm. it's just impossible. So you'll see a lot of the time you can click, we say kink, kink will put up kink.com. Oh, porn website. Uh, we'll put up like 10 minutes of their trailer and then like a link to their thing. Cause it's promo. Cause porn have this huge amount of traffic like it's insane and you know they're making a little bit of money back from their stolen content um so that's been like the new kind of strategy with hmm. those um Pornhub also just recently uh started a pay to view thing so basically just like clips for sale or other uh websites where you just pay for per clip per clip that you want to watch um so that's kind of interesting um, I'll see how that works on their site when it's like half pirated stuff and half for pay. I don't know how that's right. going to work exactly, but, um, so, but yeah. so it, it monetizes not, on, your, not only your paid per click, but I guess the idea is it's almost like an advertisement for your own site where you can find more. Yeah. Oh, um, huge. Yeah. But so yes, um, porn in a way, uh, you know, especially if you're, cause there's, there are some people that are making a lot of money off of porn, but it's like, it's like 11 girls, you know, um, and the industry has a lot of people in it. So people who are making money consistently are very few. So, yeah, people supplement it with all kinds of stuff. And porn is good advertisement uh, for that um, through the escorting, camming, making your own clips. Like it definitely helps promote all that. Um, so it is in, in a way. uh Kind of, but it didn't used to be, you know, porn used to, like, I always hear, I was not in pornography during the golden age. Right. Um, you know, but I hear about it all the time and just like how much money people were making and like how much work there was. And it's just not, it's like people talking about, anymore. it's like when you hear journalists talk about what it was like to write for magazines in the seventies, eighties and nineties, <laughs> you know, it's, it's the same thing uh just a different industry you know oh the money the money you could make writing for you know vanity fair um you know that's i I think another thing i mean it's okay like i think of music you know when people started being able to pirate music uh you got access to more music than you could possibly afford to actually buy right yeah. So people would just have these huge libraries of music and they, no, oh, no, yeah. no one would, would have been able to buy that many CDs. And so once that happens, you can't go back to, to, you know, willing to buy, you know, all those CDs. So kind of, I mean, you, yeah. I, you know what? I used to illegally download shit all the time and still I started making my own content and I just, mm-hmm. When I realized and felt that feeling of finding my clips being pirated and all that work that I had done, 
I stopped. Well, I <laughs> guess what I mean stop is pirating things. <laughs> I mean, pe- people are willing to move past pirating, but it's hard to go back to the model of the 90s and early 2000s. Instead, people are more willing to pay a subscription fee to simply yeah. to stream all that music. Uh, uh, right. And, I, and there I, are stuff like yeah. that. Sorry, you yeah, like, uh, what is it, like, I think Hot Movies does that. There are sites where you can pick from different companies and, like, watch different videos. So that I, does I exist. I just wonder if that's the direction, you know, that the the the, the suits at Pornhub. That, I wonder if that's where they want to go eventually. Is... You know, I think, I think like, kind of like a Netflix for porn-esque kind of yeah. thing. Um, you know, people are talking about that. I could totally see that going that way. Um I really think, though, attitudes about paying for porn, like people do not have the same, like, they really don't see any value in our work, even though they consume it. Uh, they don't respect our work either. Right. Um, so I'm, I'm generalizing, but there's a lot of people who, who you know, consume pornography that, like, do, do not respect it in any way. So they see no point in paying where they would totally pay for food at a restaurant or go to the movies or whatever, but this particular, you know, industry and this particular medium, like they refuse to pay for and they feel entitled to it. It's like they, they already sort of think it's dirty and shameful. So pirating it doesn't seem any more bad. Oh yeah. And they don't respect the people making it. I don't know how many people like, you know, have told me like, Oh yeah. I mean, I watch porn, but all those girls are like stupid bitches that could have done something better with their lives or whatever, you know, that is. And I'm like, wow, you, that's really hypocritical. Not only that, that makes, if you think like these people are in such a bad place or so stupid and you still get off on the material, like there's something wrong with you. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, um, so that's also, I think plays a hand into it too. And, you know, and I think, you know, the past couple of years, we've been hearing more people talking about porn addiction, what porn does to people's brains. And, you know, we often hear of the, it usually focuses on, on dudes who watch porn, of, of them getting kind of uh, almost like drug addicts having to pursue greater and greater highs. <laughs> and I, I can't help but think that, that the just having access to all this free pirated uh, stuff doesn't contribute to that. You know, I mean, it seems to me that if we somehow, you know, you know, made people really think about the ethics of, of pirating porn and, 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 you know, teach them to, you know, take that work seriously, that that could actually remedy the problems that we have when people are just, you know, watching clip after clip after clip you know, it's it's like it's like it's as with music it's it's like when people are able to pirate music that's when people can't listen to a song all the way through you know i don't know if you've ever ridden in the car with someone who's just like listens to a minute and a half or two minutes of a song and then skips to the next one skips to the next one it's just like in, in this you know algorithmic rabbit hole um i don't know yeah I don't know. I have really mixed uh, views with the idea of like porn addiction. Yeah. I don't necessarily think it really exists. Yeah. I believe that you can become addicted to a thing, but I don't find pornography pornography inherently addictive. Right. Um, well, it's like uh, it's like you know, cannabis isn't addictive in the way that nicotine is, but can people use it as a crutch? You know, totally. Or, yeah. But then does that mean we need to ban everything because people can't handle their shit? I mean, it's the same with food. Are we going to stop eating because people become like addicted to food or exercise? I mean, people get hooked and take things to an unhealthy level in almost every activity. Yeah. If you look for it, you can find it. Yeah. Um, well, where do you, where do, when it comes ahead. to. Hmm? No, you go ahead. Oh, and when it comes to, like, I know people a lot of the time are like, well, porn is warping men's minds of what sex is supposed to be like. And I'm like, well, there is absolutely no sex education in this country that's, like, appropriate. So 
unfortunately, you know, people are going to porn for for to learn how to have sex. And you don't watch The Fast and the Furious to learn how to drive a car. It you should be taking that same thing to pornography. Like hmm. pornography is a fantasy unless you're watching educational porn, which does exist. Um, they do have those. Um, you aren't seeing everything in the picture and you're should be watching it as a fantasy and not necessarily something in reality. Um, and that's something that really bothers me and that I do see porn viewers. It's like they don't seem to understand when to turn off real life and fantasy. Um, like we don't, I, I like to use like anal sex scenes as a really good example. Um, in order to shoot that kind of scene, there's a lot of prep that goes into it. Right. Um, people clean themselves out and see up to enema. You have to stretch out. Uh, you have to, to, you know, use lube, all these things we do not show on camera because we're creating, you know, this atmosphere and this thing, like, it's just not, it's not a how to. Um, but so then like people watch it and they're like, Oh, I can just like, you know, uh, yeah. Enter somebody like that. No problem. It's easy. Um, and I don't blame porn. I really blame the fact that there's just no sex ed out there, not sex ed. That's actually helpful telling kids that they're going to die of STDs or to stay abstinent is not helpful, but giving people like actual guides on how to like enjoy themselves and sex and how to do these acts safely would be great. Um, and I think that's, that's the biggest problem with that. You know, we shouldn't be turning to movies uh, to learn how to do things in real life. You know, we don't do it with anything else. Right. Why are we doing it's porn? Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Where, yeah. where do you think, you know, I, I, Ross Douthat's article a couple months ago calling for a ban on porn. And it, it does seem like this talk is more in the mix recently uh, than has of late. I don't know. Why do you think that is? I think this country is going through like a sex moralistic panic. Um uh, I mean, every aspect of uh, strip clubs are being raided right now. FOSTA happened. Uh, they've been getting, they've been, t porn's being, it has been being attacked for a while uh, in different facets. Uh, there's just like this huge crackdown. Um, what, it, why are strip I, clubs being raided? I haven't heard about that. Why is that? Mm -hmm. What's up? Yeah, I haven't heard about this, about strip clubs being raided. Oh, yeah, nonstop. They're being raided because of trafficking, quote unquote. Um, and it's, you know, keeping people from being able to go to work. Uh, it's been a it's been a big problem. It's been happening a lot in New Orleans. Uh, they had protests in New York. A lot of some some reason, a lot of stripper movements do not get covered by the media. Um, so, yeah, the, they have a lot of organizing as well. Yeah. But yeah, in, in general, I mean, and not just sex work, but sexual liberties. I mean, if let's take FOSTA, for example, um, so when they, you know, in, in light well, of FOSTA. I, I guess uh, yeah. for those who, you know, maybe we should briefly describe what FOSTA is for people who yeah, don't totally. know. Since, you know, it, it's, it's often sort of fallen through the cracks in news coverage. But, um, oh, yeah. So FOSTA is um, basically a bill that was signed in that made platforms responsible to, with, for whatever was happening on the platforms, specifically uh, when it comes to sex trafficking. And now let's. You step back. Sex trafficking defined by the U.S. government defined by the U.S. government is not what you think. Um, it, like in the state of California, if a worker drives another worker, like another sex worker, to work, and specifically like prostitution, um, that person is a sex trafficker hmm. because they've aided in helping uh, someone or if you say you live with someone else and you pay rent and you're a sex worker and the other person isn't they're benefiting from the money of a sex worker they're a trafficker oh wow um, yeah there's a huge conflation between sex trafficking and consensual sex work um and it's on purpose because it's not about sex trafficking if you really gave a fuck about sex i'm sorry sorry for swearing <laughs> but oh. if you really cared about uh sex trafficking then you would have listened to actual sex traffic uh, trafficking uh, survivors and the Department of Justice that came out against FOSTA saying that this would actually push trafficked victims further underground. Right, because by taking away they were actually like like the DOJ was working with 
sites like Backpage and whatnot, right? And we're actually able yeah. to. Yeah. And I'd like to clarify that, like, I would say, like, for probably like 90% of Backpage was consensual workers. Um, and like, I'm not saying that sex trafficking doesn't exist. And there's actually a lot of crossover within our industries. There are a lot of people who have been trafficked that, you know, once they leave, they end up becoming like consensual sex workers. Like they're not like these, like, it's weird. We like, it, they're two very different things, but they, they can intersect. Um, wait, where was I going with this? I was like on a roll and then I like totally, oh. uh, my point um, so, oh yeah, so this was their only way of, of finding people that were being trafficked. Um, that was their only like link to the outside world. Um, there was a really good thread on Twitter started by a lawyer saying that, you know, she heard one of her clients was someone that was, um, being trafficked and the only way she was able to keep in touch with her client was through her ads. Hmm. Because her number would change every time and whatever, and was finding her on those ads and being able to call her numbers. That was how she was able to keep in touch. Um, so yeah, <laughs> uh, it cut people off. Um, also, you know, there's a, and this is like a controversial kind of opinion. A lot of people that are considered trafficked are not necessarily trafficked, but they're under age workers and before you take away their only means of survival maybe you should give them housing and safe places to like and food and safe places to live you know what i mean like a lot of these kids are runaway kids leaving really unsafe homes and we have crap social services in this country and that's their only way of survival so before you take away their only way of survival, maybe you should, you know, uh, provide them with actual help. So it's complicated. It's, yeah. a, it's not an easy cut and dry issue, you know, and it's not black and white. There's a lot of gray. Um, and some of the things may make people uncomfortable, but I mean, it's just the reality, you know? Well, I know uh, you and... Uh, uh, Maxine Holloway, you've started an organization in the San Francisco Bay Area, right? Um, Bay yes. Area Pros Support. Um, what What's sort of the purpose of that organization? Because it's it seems to me, at least, it was partly inspired by the fallout from FOSTA. Yeah, I mean, it started. <laughs> Basta was happening and I, you know, was freaking out and texted Maxine and I was like, she like, I was like, oh what do we do? I was like, should we hold a meeting? And she said, yes. So we just held an emergency meeting and just put it out there. And about with like, I, I keep getting the numbers wrong, but the actual number was, it was like 50, 55 sex workers showed up to this meeting. People we did not know. Like that was something I was afraid of. I was like, Oh, is this just going to be like a circle jerk of like me and my friends, like just talking to each other. Right. And it was just like people from all kinds of doing all kinds of different kinds of sex work in different like economic places as well um all showed up and you know uh for that first meeting we you know provided people with like cyber security uh also giving people different options on like where they could advertise this was before everything was taken down or so we were just taking everything step by step um and also just creating support um, and then, you know, as things continued, we continued the meetings and then I realized that like we need to like make this like an actual thing and provide things for sex workers. So uh, a couple things BAPS has been working on right now. Uh, we just started an outreach program. Um, so that means we're going out and uh, providing street based workers with condoms water, coffee, you know, hygiene supplies, uh, clean, um, like needle exchange, uh, resources because like we do have some intersection, um, in the, uh, the uh, you know, drug using community. Um, and basically anything that we can possibly provide. We also like have to ask them what they need because we can't assume you know what 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 people need um but that's kind of like so what we've started um so we've done some of that 
Uh, we're also creating our own media because, you know, sex workers get covered by the media all the time in all sorts of awful ways. So we found it really important to create our own. Um, we're also doing things like um, help. So like one of the things that we're doing um, so far, all the sites that have gone down, by the way, are all low cost or free sites. All the sites that are on the high end um, have not gone down. So now a lot of the people that are using these free sites, for, some of them just like don't have the money to do it. And that pushes people to start doing street based work. Or they can afford to like put up enough money to buy a, uh add on those sites. But those sites are very specific. And if you do not, there's a, a, a some sort of like, like class passing that you have to do uh, to be able to be successful on those sites. So like we've been offering like professional photo shoot days and stuff like that. So people are able to actually like make money. Um, you know, it's it struck me. Yeah. I know that I... I mean, I've, I've, I've read and I've tried to make sense out of the legal distinction between a, quote, prostitute and a, quote, escort. It often seems to me that it's really more a class difference than, than anything else. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, the, the, I mean that's, it's just bullshit. Like, an yeah. escort is right, just someone that you spend time with and there's no sex involved. That does not exist. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, well, that's right. Not. Isn't, isn't the legal conceit that you're paying for time with them and then if sex happens, then that's just free? That's No, not... that's still considered, it's still considered prostitution oh, legally. Okay. Like, oh, yeah. No, that's, okay. that's something people tell themselves to feel better, oh, but okay. no. <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's it's still considered prostitution but it's, it's definitely a matter then of, of having the sort of social and cultural capital to I, I, as you said class pass to sort of signal um to attract uh, a certain more elite clientele um, very much so you can charge more all kinds of stuff yeah yeah, there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions about uh, workers that charge less and they're not true, n- necessarily all true. So uh, a lot of people who, you know, have the means won't go to them because they have all these like preconceived notions of what they're like. Um, so, yeah. Do, do they think- I mean, all the fa- all the problems that happen in the world happen in the sex industry just as well, you know. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, is it is it yeah. is it the fear that people who don't charge as much are more likely to like have STDs or have a drug addiction or all that kind of stuff? And it's just not true. And I'm someone that like I worked my way up. You know, I don't come from a lot of my. I'm not. I didn't grow up poor, but I not grew up with a lot. Um, and so when I was you know 18, I was on my own. Um, and you know I started doing different things. And I definitely when I first started was not like a. I was, you know, not doing like street based work or anything on on that level, but I wasn't charging like the most, you know, and then I worked my way up and got lucky and also invested a lot of money and also have enough privilege that I was very busy. So I made a lot of money that I was able to like my work my way up to becoming a high end provider. But I'm still the same person. You know what I mean? Um, And people have different needs. Some people are really not into doing like long sessions where they're going on vacation or having dinners with clients and they would really rather them like be in and out or they would prefer having like higher volume or lower volume. Everyone has different needs. Some high end providers are high end because they're sick. Like a lot of people are disabled. Sex work is a great job for people with disability um, because if you're sick, you don't lose your job. You you know, you can work as much or as little as you can if you are able to get the work, obviously. Um, There's there's a lot of things that go with it. So some people, like, it's just the fact that they can't work a lot, so they charge a lot to make up means for that. There's so many different personal reasons um, why people charge differently, and uh, that's not necessarily the case. I've met sober and drug-using providers, you know, on the lower end of the price uh, spectrum and I've met drug users and non-drug users in the high end that none of it means shit it's really just the brand of shoes and how much money they've been able to make you know and, and privilege goes into it but that has nothing to do with the kind of service you're going to get mm-hmm. or the kind of person that you're going to see you yeah. know you know I've seen some talk about how the way we talk about Stormy Daniels 
that there's a, a, cl- a class aspect to it. I, uh, someone who's been on blogging ends before, David Walsh has, I think this was David Walsh, said that the way that the media is treating Stormy Daniels, that they would not treat like Stoya the same way. Or, uh, in that, you know, uh, not only is she, is she a porn actor, but she's not perceived as like a like porn chic kind of, you know, like, you know, she's not going to get like a, she's not going to write an op-ed in the New York times like Stoya. I mean, I think Stormy is an incredibly privileged worker. So yeah. I'm like, Meh. um, well, I guess, I guess class is I, a I, tricky I know thing. I, I know what you're saying in the differences. I know what you're saying. Like, right. Uh, Stoya is the like presentable porn star because she can like, I, I know what you're saying. Yeah. Um, and I, yeah, I think that definitely goes into it uh, for sure. Uh, that's definitely a thing. Yeah. I, I mean, know, it's respectability politics, right? Right. It's I know, what's more palatable to outsiders. Yeah. I know you wrote an article, uh, was it for the outline? Um, yeah. About, yeah. Uh, about um, the kind of liberal pearl clutching about you know, oh, he's with a porn star um, and how sort of hypocritical. I wonder if you could sort of talk about that a bit. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Let me like let me look at my article right now. <laughs> 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 oh, I've been running around too much. Here we go. I mean, there's a lot. Um, I mean, I was seeing all this like mainstream coverage and it still was like just as obs- I mean, I guess I, ex- I expect, uh, you know, horse shaming and all this kind of stuff uh, from white right wingers. So when that happens, I like don't care about an eye. So right. but there's a lot of like um, really problematic ways the the uh, the left talks about sex workers. Um, first, reporting her legal name has nothing to do with anything. Like sex workers use pseudonyms for a reason, and um, has nothing to do with story. I mean, they've also just been replacing her name with porn star. Like, if she, like she's not a person; she has a name. Right. Um, and I mean, they did the same kind of stuff with like Millennia. Um, Millennia when she when. Trump was running for president. I'm like, you could bash that presidency for so many things, but they chose to focus on her nude photos. And this was, you know, and they compared her to Michelle Obama and they were like, is this what like your first lady is supposed to look like? And I was just like, like, that's what you're going to focus on. There's so much wrong with this administration, but you know, let's, there's a weird, there's a weird rhetorical tactic that I often see people on the left use that I just don't know how effective it is. And it's where, there's like a a vow like a, a principle that you don't hold but you think the right holds and when they're hypocritical on it you like call them out on it like it it, uh, it, it doesn't convince anyone um, so it's like oh you claim to care about x y and z and here's this evidence that theoretically i don't actually think is problematic but it, but in the end you're just you know slut shaming or um, yeah, you're reinforcing you're right. these things. Oh, yeah. I mean, the New York Times, the Washington Post, Entertainment Weekly, like, they all, like, kind of threw, threw some, wrote some really stuff that was pretty, pretty awful. I mean, there was one, what was his name? Uh, you know, Bill Crystal. Yeah. Like, he straight up was talking about, uh, what was it? He basically was talking about her credibility because she was a porn star. Because somehow, because she makes adult films, like, what she says is not true. Like, that was really insulting. Uh, And, you know, this whole, like, you know, when talking about Trump and and Stormy, they're just keep talking about the indecency and the fact that he had sex with the porn star or like why don't you focus on the fact that they've like used campaign money to shut a woman up right like that is way more important uh than that Be- because uh, because when they only focus on oh he had an affair with the porn star they think that there's some you know conservative person who's going to say oh oh trump did what oh i don't support him anymore now well that's yeah, not gonna and happen you know what? they didn't care <laughs> Because and, and and they're right for saying like it, a, a supporter of Trump would be right in saying, well, that doesn't really matter. And you 
uh, if, if that's all we're focusing on is the fact that they had an affair with a porn star, they're going to say, oh, that doesn't matter. And, you know, Bill Clinton could have easily done the same thing and you wouldn't care then. So, uh, uh, but it, that's because we don't talk about the real, you know, uh, meat of the issue that, you know, paying people to shut up and Lord knows, you know, where that money was coming from and all yeah. that. And I mean, the left uses sex workers as weapons to like discredit the right, like for their hypocrisy, right? And then like using us as, I mean, we're we're like they're uh, we're like disregarded as people and used as weapons. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, um, and, and you're also right. You're also supposed to cure like incels, right? Oh uh, yes. Well, yes. We're supposed to, and also rapists should come see us because that's how you deal with that that's uh insane i mean i can't even (laughs) i can't even go into that um you know uh but i mean i mean keeps going like i don't know it's like all these people left and right like almost everybody and as someone who's done a lot of different types of sex work almost everybody you know everybody from every group uh sees sex workers and people in like really high uh, uh, places, very famous people, people with like very like important jobs all do this. Uh, you know, they all partake, but they completely dissociate us from us in public. So like the consumers of the sex industry have left us behind. Hmm. You know what I mean? Um, and I, they, I they hide. So while we're... As well. Exactly. No, you didn't see any clients like come out and, you know, uh, and there's so many, I mean, from people in politics to celebrities, it's just everywhere. Um, and so, you know, you know, they get to come in and partake in our, in our, you know, services or, uh, you know, watch our films and all that stuff. And, you know, all you know, so especially with like if in person work, you know, they get to let their social mask off. You know, off. We see them for who they are, and all of them things that like other people don't see. But then when they're done, they get to put that mask back on, and they get to go out and have the same privileges, fame, awards, presidencies, while we're uh, forever labeled as the whores, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's just incredibly hypocritical. <laughs> um, I mean. President Trump signed, like, vowed, he didn't do it, I don't know if he did anything, but, like, when he was running for presidency, he vowed, like, a war on porn when he was in a bunch of Playboy movies, Yeah, you know? Um, it's just ridiculous. Um, you know, I want to talk uh, before we, yeah. well, while we're still talking, um, I have a piece coming out. Uh, it should be out by the time this video posts in uh, Mel Magazine. Uh, people who might remember if, if they watched Arye's conversation with Miles Clay or Clee on uh, Culturally Determined. Uh, he writes for Mill Magazine. Anyway, I have a piece coming out talking about uh, the alt-right's kind of wacky conspiracy theory about porn, uh, which is... Uh, uh, so, so, I mean, there's, there's a weird anti-Semitic angle to it, for one thing, because yes. historically Jews have had a disproportionate presence in the porn industry for similar reasons that they did in Hollywood period. Um, so, so, you know, there is a, I guess a kernel of historical truth there, but the, the, can you enlighten me on that? Because I don't, didn't uh, know that there was a huge amount of Jews in the porn industry or like running the porn industry. There's a uh, one agent that's Jewish and he's the biggest agent. Uh, well, the CEO of vivid is Jewish. Vivid's but- dead. Oh really? Vivid is fucking dead. They don't even make movies anymore. No, well, I think this is more video. historical thing. I think. Oh okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, sorry. And, sorry. and also, uh, so the owner a, of Vivid a guy was. Named, oh, I forget what his name now, but in like the seventies and eighties, he was the largest distributor of porn in the in the U.S. I, I want to say okay. Hirsch. He he had this adult bookstore empire. Oh, and the founder of Screw Magazine and uh, people who were like, you know, so old. Stuff. Yeah, okay. and, and they also talk about no, 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 no. Just Ron Jeremy and uh, oh, uh, Nina Hartley. Um, I mean, yeah, there's Jewish performers, but do you know how many non-Jewish performers there are? Right. Like, well, that's... I mean, yeah, that's why I say a Colonel. Uh, but yeah, the, the, yeah, sorry. They're, they're, just but their theory, to... their theory is that porn is a Jewish conspiracy to yeah, turn white men, strong 
white men into these, you know, addicted beta males who are more interested in porn than actual women. And, and then the, 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 the theory goes, then fewer white men are having sex with fewer white women. It, and, uh, and so instead, we, there's more interracial relationships. And so the end goal is just, you know, m- making the white race extinct, leaving supposedly I, Jews, yeah, the, what... leaving Jews, the only high IQ people in the West, and then they'll control everything then. That, that's, yeah. yeah. And I, well, I, I really true. saw this coming out of the woodworks after Ross Douthat's article came out. And I think that it's part of, I don't know if if Steve Bannon had any part in this uh, uh, <laughs> in this weird rhetoric about porn from Trump and et cetera. I mean, obviously, there's an evangelical uh, angle to it as well, but there is this weird, not religiously based uh, white nationalist movement against porn uh, that's I think bigger than people might realize. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're actually. I did not know. I didn't know this. Um, I also like try to stay away from as a, as Trolls, a yeah. immigrant Persian Jew. I, I don't I don't read a lot of their publications. Um, oh, they would definitely they would definitely think you're 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 in on it, no doubt. Oh, you know what's actually amazing though? I have Fox News comment uh, commenters that follow my Twitter. Really? I think that's pretty interesting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a joke. I actually get a ton of manga. Uh, like, I mean, you know, once in a while you fuck around on your phone and like, look at who's following you. I don't know how many people with manga in their profile, like follow me. It's kind of, I actually don't understand it. Um, but maybe they want to jerk off to the thing they hate most. I don't know. It's very interesting. The the alt-right people are definitely watching the things that they're condemning. There's no doubt about it. Uh But But, like uh, the fear, okay. Oh, I would like to touch that like fear of like black men taking all our white women. I mean, that was the one of the main like fear tactic tactics that they used when they started the war on drugs. Um, Harry Aslinger started, started it. Um, and it was a total like racist attack on, on, on black people. And one of the like most common things is like, if a black person smokes weed, they go crazy and they'll steal your white women. So this kind of, this idea has been yeah. going on in a different different area well, and uh, the uh, issues for a the, long time there's the man act the m-a-n-n act in the early 20th century that made it if you moved someone across state lines for illicit purposes then that was a federal crime and like uh the the, the black boxer joe johnson was arrested for for, for that and so it, it was 100 years ago uh a law meant to supposedly meant to combat sex trafficking, essentially what they called white slavery, enslavement of white women, often to black pimps or, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, that it was, it was very racially coded. And also even like in the late 19th or the 20th century, the movement against masturbation, pornography, often the, the, behind that was this idea of, oh, white people are getting over civilized and they're not having as many babies and we need to discourage anything that's not, you know, procreation. Um, so right. pretty, pretty similar rhetoric from 100 years ago as we're seeing now with the talk of... Yeah. Because even a mainstream person like Ross Douthat and, and other... Uh, and people who aren't even conservative, they'll, they'll still say things like, uh, you know, that American society is trending Japanward, which, you know, they, they're, af- they're afraid of white men, you know, becoming like a stereotypical... Japanese person who prefers, you know, who, who and, and, you know, they'll talk about declining birth rates and not, uh, they're not concerned about the declining birth rates of, you know, brown people. I can assure you that. Oh, no. Um, but yeah, it's a wild world to live in. Oh, yeah. No, it's totally nuts. Yeah, but I've heard, I've heard the like Jewish mafia porn thing for a long time. I can't speak on that much Mm -hmm. um i'm jewish and i have not been invited to the jewish mafia i'm very (laughs) offended if there is one (laughs) um but you know there's people from like all over the place so i don't think it's uh you know and it may have been in the in the history uh but definitely not necessarily these days Hmm. um you know there's there's spiegler uh who is the biggest um biggest agent in porn who's jewish but like 
I don't know anybody else in like that's running agencies or all high up, but you know, I could be wrong. No. I can't speak on it because I just don't know. Right. Um, well, I, I did want to ask you for I let you go. Um, oh yeah. If you have any resources, any books you've read recently about porn, sex work, you know, that you think would that you know that you just recommend, yeah. you think uh, uh, expose people to different ways of looking at this stuff. Uh, Playing the Whore by Alyssa Gia Grant is really good. I really suggest that book. Um, That's probably my favorite that I've read so far when it comes to writings on sex work. Uh, There's a book. Tell tell, tell me about that book. I don't know about Playing the Whore. Playing the Whore? Yeah, what's it say? It's, I mean, it's about uh, specifically like uh, prostitution and um, the laws and how intersex and it's written by a former sex worker who is a journalist. So um, I'm way more, I don't actually care about what non-sex workers have to say about sex work at all. (laughs) Straight up. I'm being very honest, but Mm -hmm. I don't, um, if you have not done the work, you don't understand it as Mm -hmm. you can study it as much as you can. I mean, just like anything else I can read about like, you know, the black civil rights and all that stuff, that doesn't mean I have any idea what it's like to be a black person, in the, you know, in the world. So I feel that way about that. Um, That's the book that I would recommend the most. There is a newer book about the history, like, uh, of sex worker, of sex work in political activism. Hmm. Um, and I, I want to look it up because I don't, I, I don't know if it's sure. come out yet, but it's, amazing and the woman one of the women that's writing it is just a badass and she did a ted talk recently actually about sex work uh her name is juno mack juno mack juno mack does she argue that like sex workers have have had a you know have often been at the forefront maybe of various oh yeah yes very much so um, yeah, and her TED Talk is basically, uh, what do sex workers want? Mm-hmm. And she's talking about the differences, which is actually great to watch. I really suggest people check that out, too. And it kind of goes into the difference between, like, legalization and decriminalization and, you know, uh, other other needs that uh, sex workers have. I'm trying to see if there's the name of her books. Her book, it's about to come out, but well, it might not be. We, we can link to it. Uh, it- yeah, in I'll look case. for it, yeah. and, uh, you know, because it's it's pretty great. But those two are like my favorites. What um, is the... A lot of the other Go stuff ahead. about sex work are. Oh, there's also Sex Workers Unite, and that's about the history of sex work as well. Um, there's not a lot of books about like sex work, and there's more about memoirs, which I don't really necessarily care for. Yeah. Um, just because everybody has such a different experience, that I don't think that's a great way to read that and then be like, that's what the sex industry is like, you know? Um, so yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think a main point that I do want to make before we finish is that, um, there are a lot of problems in the sex industry. Um, but if we continue to stigmatize and to force it underground, it will just create more and more unsafe, uh, practices and silence the workers. Um, so I'm not trying to pretend like there aren't issues within our industry, but there is no way for us to move past them if we keep being treated the way we are. Well, what would you identify as some major problems then in the industry? I mean, just like the rest of the... Okay, Rashida Jones made that entire Hot Girls Wanted right. uh, you know, documentary. And you know, a year later, there's a huge scandal about all the rape and sexual assault in Hollywood. I mean, there's problems with consent in porn as well. There's all the problems that exist within the world happen in porn. So racism, I mean, we didn't even get to that. But um, well, we can get to it. I, you, the, uh, there's a, a BuzzFeed article about, yeah. uh, and, and really, this, 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 isn't just about, it. this isn't just about race. It's also about consent. Um, yeah. Porn actor Mo the Monster, uh, where... Uh, he was, he, he's black and it was an interracial scene and they wanted the N word to be used. Uh, and he didn't, he, he, he did not consent to that. He didn't want, he didn't want the word no. used. Said no twice. So yeah. No, I guess you, you probably know the details of it better than I do. You can pick up. Oh, 
Sorry, I'm no, gonna, no. I, I no, grew no, up no. with three sisters. You interrupt each other all the time. No, I hear you. No, for real. I wasn't trying to be snippy. No. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, he was asked, you know, two times. He said no both times. They asked the actress if she was a new one, she or if she was okay with it. She said yes. Um, and then in the middle of the scene, he hears the N word as he's about to pop, like I think two times, and he's done. And he's now suing the producer, um, which is fucking awesome. I'm um, really. Yeah. I hope it goes forward. Uh, yeah, the BuzzFeed article has has a, some, a legal document that shows these just horrific texts that he was getting from the producer afterward. When he was trying to get them to just not release the clip, or at least to edit out uh, that phrase mm-hmm. from the clip, and I mean, yeah, oh, definitely yeah. harassment of, of him. Oh yeah, people of color in porn, and I'm a, I mean, and I've experienced. I'm a very light skin POC. I have light skin passing. My dad's from a run. He's much darker. I'm not. Um, I have even experienced like really non consensual race play. Um, and black people within the porn industry, it's like on a whole other level. Um, so this, like, there is no performer of color that does not, is not confronted by this at some point. Um, this kind of dynamic, um, uh, the porn industry has a very racist info infrastructure. Uh, so women will, a lot, a lot of the time will hold off on doing IR and IR interracial porn never means anything else. I'm mixed race, so I like to make the joke that every scene I do is IR just to annoy people. (laughs) But (laughs) IR means a black man and a white woman. Um, That's what, you know, that's what they mean. And um, so a lot of, so they'll save it and not do it because it's considered an extreme scene. So they'll do anal or gangbang before they'll like fuck a black man, which is insane. Um, And they can demand a lot of money for it. And agencies push this you know and companies definitely like encourage this and uh it's a thing i also have friends that like will you know do not ask for it and have been told by their agents like you're a dumb girl you know um because you don't want to make money and you know uh, they didn't understand uh the how like morally wrong that was um so there's really racist like infrastructure in porn um and again the whole world is super racist black people are literally being murdered by police every single day so uh of course it's also found in pornography um and because and since like we are so stuffed underground this kind of stuff just like goes all the time unchecked um and then people can point to that those abuses and say that's why we should push it even further underground exactly which is such bullshit and it quiets actual victims you know um and then no Anybody that's having a hard time, like, we don't want to speak out about the problems in porn because then we feel like we're just giving aunties fuel instead of talking about, like, important labor rights, you know? Yeah. Um, the, the problem within porn is not that there's, it's a, there's a sexual nature, is that there are no, there's no workers' rights protection at mm. all. Like, we don't have that. We don't have unions. You know, we don't have any of that. Um, and that, that's the biggest problem. Is there anywhere, like in Europe or anywhere, where it's unionized? Or? Um, I do not know. Yeah. I don't know about uh, that in pornography. I know that there were, at some point, and those, the, the woman that's Juno Mack would be the perfect person to ask, because she probably knows. Um, I think there was like a union of prostitutes at one point, I think in France or something, or Tried or something. Right. And they've been unionized. I mean, I worked in a unionized strip club or we were strip up. We were a peep show. We have the only in the United States that I've ever heard of. We were a co-op and a new, any union. Uh, the union came first, um, in the 1990s it was called the lusty lady. Um, and later on, uh, the workers decided to buy the, the business it's gone now. Um, but so there have been places and strippers have like, you know, fought to unionize a lot in this country as well. Um, I, again, I'm not a history major in it, so I don't know all the background within uh, sex worker rights movements, but it's been there. Um, I don't know how long they've stuck or succeeded, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I guess that would often get shut out of mainstream discussions of workers' rights. and. Oh, of course. I mean, okay, yeah. so uh, Paul, uh, Maxine Holloway and I are putting on... So 
June 2nd is the International uh, Sex Workers Day. It has also been called International Whores Day. I don't necessarily love that word and not really into reclaiming it, so I call it whatever I want. (laughs) But if you look up, uh, you can find it under that as well. Um, But uh, So we've been organizing the Bay Area contingent. Basically, it's happening all over the United States. Um, And we've been working with a lot of different organizations and a lot of like labor rights activists have been helping us, or or actually not a lot, uh, two. (laughs) And um, when they were helping us, you know, they were like, like, you know, when we put out a call, I thought we were going to be able to get you all the support, but nobody touched it. So even from, from, from other people in the labor movement. What? Yeah. Yeah. So even like people in like labor movements do not want to touch sex workers rights. Um, it's pretty insane. They're afraid it will hurt them. their cause, I suppose. You know, I don't know what their their no. reasoning behind it. Maybe it'll, they're afraid it'll hurt their cause. Maybe they conflate uh, trafficking, sex trafficking with consensual work, which is crazy because trafficking doesn't just exist in the sex industry. Right. There are all forms of like labor trafficking in, in the world. Um, but everybody really likes to focus on this uh, sp- only, right? Uh, nobody discusses the other abuses that happens or sweatshops or all that kind of stuff. Um, because I think, I think in a weird way, I find like anti-sex or anti-trafficking people to actually be fetishizing that idea in a way. Like they're so obsessed with this idea that it's almost as if they're getting off on it. I don't know. It does something for them because they're not focusing on any other forced labor. Like, right. do you see what I mean? Like, well, certainly that news coverage, you know, you know, you, you know, you're, you're not going to you're going to see more uh, you, kind of juicy news coverage t- talking about, mm-hmm. you know, sex trafficking. And sex, victims than, the word sex. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 This, this country hates sex, but is also so obsessed with it. It's, uh, it's, it's very, I don't know. It's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I know people can follow, they can follow Bay Area Pros Support. That's at on Twitter, at Bay Pros Support. That's B-A-Y-P-R-O-S Support. Um, and they can also follow you at Arabelle Raphael. Um, you do plug your stuff. Uh, so I guess our audience should, should just know, should be prepared for that. Um, yes, all kinds of things on there. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, and people can follow me at William R. Black. And uh, anything else you wanted to say? No, I think that's it. If there's okay. anything else you wanted to cover or anything like that, I know um, we kind of went through a lot of yeah, different things. So. That's a lot. Well, yeah. Uh, thank you for coming on. Uh, this has been a really great conversation. Great. Thank you for having me. Oh, no problem. All right. You have a good day. You too.